Blake and Freud in a Century of Painting Life has been in development for a couple of years now. It first began with a group of Tate collection works which was shown at the Getty, um, which then travelled to uh, Malaga and then Aros in Denmark. And that group of Tate collection works has been expanded in this exhibition and it's looking at um, the more expanded idea of what figurative painting in Britain could look like in the 21st century. So the exhibition really starts with uh, Bacon and Freud and the sort of circle around the latter part of the 20th century, but at the same time the exhibition looks forward and backward. So it looks at some of the, the subject matter and the style of painting of uh, Bacon, Freud, uh, Auerbach, Kotai, Andrews, but it looks at the sort of precursors to that period, so introducing sort of viewers who might know that work to works by Sicke or Soutin, and then also uh, the sort of latter younger generation, I suppose, of, of artists who are still working with the figure in London. For somebody who doesn't know British art particularly well, this exhibition will not only introduce them to uh, new works they might not have seen before by key figures like Bacon and Freud, it'll also expand their idea about what British art is, I hope, looking at British figurative art from the whole 20th century. I also think there's lots of different types of painting in this show. Interestingly, about half of the artists in this exhibition weren't actually born in the UK. Um, in the post-war period, artists like Freud or Auerbach, for example, they were fleeing Nazi Germany and they arrived in London as refugees. So this sort of um, London as a cosmopolitan city reverberates throughout the whole exhibition. Uh, we've got artists like also Sousa, who came from Fertingo and then Mumbai. But that sort of post-war um, migration is, is felt throughout the whole exhibition. So I think hopefully we're sort of subtly questioning what Britishness is. The dialogues that have occurred between particularly artists from uh, immigrant and refugee backgrounds over the 20th century has, I think, changed the way that we look at British art. All Too Human does look primarily at, at figurative painting. However, the, the sitters that it's looking at are, are usually people that the artists know very well, so their friends or their lovers or their children. And the exhibition expands that theme to look also at the places that they knew very well, which is something that, um, that Freud in particular, but also um, Auerbach, Kosov, many of the artists, um, they would so for example, in the Freud room, you can see there's a work that he spent three years on and he painted meticulously this tiny, tiny corner of his studio, uh, all of the sort of um, the plants and the, and he was really trying to acclimatise to the lighting conditions of that studio. And so I think what the inclusion of landscape does is it, it rethinks the way that painters were working in figuration in the 20th century. Also Auerbach and Kosov, they returned again and again to specific places in, near their studios or near their homes. And they were taught by David Bomberg, whose teaching was very much taking his students out into London and asking them to work directly from, from particular sites. And a lot of those sites in the post-war period were bomb sites because so much of London had been bombed. So there's sort of a, a slight political element in that sense, I suppose. So I guess there's two things that we could maybe conclude from that, is that it's an expansion of the way that artists are looking at their, their local environment, the intense experience of life, whether life is people or places, but also the changing landscape of London, which reappears throughout the exhibition, which is the place where all of the artists uh, lived, worked, studied or exhibited. The exhibition is structured roughly chronological. Um, there's a series of almost micro-narratives that, um, that extend throughout the exhibition. The first room looks at the sort of early precursors of the exhibition, Soutin, Sickert, Spencer and Bomberg, sort of setting up the stage for what we'll encounter in the rest of the 20th century. The second room has 
early Bacon with this sculpture of Giacometti. And that room really sets up the dialogue of the post-war period. Giacometti's figures, the isolated, sort of angst-ridden, long figures, really embodied for a lot of viewers the tension of, and the anxiety of the post-war period, the sort of dismay and the loss at what had happened. And Giacometti had a really engaged dialogue with a lot of painters in London. He had a big exhibition in 1965 at the Haywood Gallery, for example, which was curated by David Sylvester, who was also a champion of Bacon's work. So there was a dialogue going on in the 50s and 60s um, with, with Bacon and Giacometti. We've paired Giacometti and Bacon to sort of expand the idea of, uh, of that moment. And you can see the same sort of isolated figure also appearing in Bacon's work in a sort of a different way in that he's, in a lot of the works in that room are quite the figure's almost trapped or caged, but that feeling of isolation and post-war anxiety reverberates around that room. And I think it's, it's exciting to see it occurring in two different media at a sort of similar time. The third room introduces Francis Newton Sousa. Francis Newton Sousa is a really good example of the influence of, uh, or the importance of post-war migration on Britain. He's an artist who came to the UK along with a, a wave of other migrants from other Commonwealth countries in the late 40s, early 50s. He grew up in Goa but then he moved to Mumbai and then he migrated to London and his first show he had a major show in 1955 at the Gallery One and it completely sold out and it was a huge success and this show sort of places him back into that canon of um, British figurative art, which he isn't always considered part of. So he has a, an entire room dedicated to his work. It includes landscape, it includes portraiture, but also one of the black monochromes that he did in the mid-60s. The fourth room introduces uh, Coldstream and his teaching, which is the real sort of dominant mode of teaching in, in the 20th century in Britain. Coldstream was professor at the Slade and his teaching was a very visual type of teaching that was about measurement and sort of he actually would mark up the canvas in very particular ways and he's, he was very dedicated to painting from life, from a live model in the studio. The next room looks at David Bomberg's teaching, which was around the same time and Bomberg's teaching was a real reaction to Coldstream's teaching. Uh, he used to call Coldstream's teaching the hand and eye disease. Bomberg refused to, to teach his students how to pass national examinations. Instead, he took them out to London, different sites in London. He was much more interested in sort of tactility. It was still a visual form of teaching, but it was a much more sort of, he was interested in ideas of structure and mass. That room then extends into a more expanded look at uh, two of his students, um, Outback and Kosov, the work that they produced after they were taught by Bomberg and their real interest in particular sites in London places they knew very, very well. The exhibition then moves into a double module of Freud from his work from the 1960s onwards. When he moved from using very, very fine brushes and making very detailed work to using larger brushes and looser brush strokes. And, that, and he also started um, painting nudes a lot more. It's a big room with lots of different types of sizes of works. The sort of the work that he's, I suppose, quite well known for, the very fleshy sort of painting. Then we move into, oh, the room we're in now, the, the um, late Bacon room, which looks at Francis Bacon's uh, work from the 60s and 70s and their relationship to John, particularly John Deacon's photography, whom he commissioned. Uh, it, was sort of, it felt sort of impossible to contain Bacon within one room and uh, we could have had three easily, but we just uh, decided to have two. And this second room is dedicated to his mature work from the early 60s to late 70s, and particularly at this grouping of portraits. Portraiture becomes hugely important for Bacon at this moment. And he is in, his work is in dialogue with John Deacon. We know very well Bacon was always working with a broad collection of images coming from photographs of uh, um, paintings by other artists, the sculptures uh, of Rodin, all the way to news clip of um, news events. Uh, but certainly the relationship with Deacon was one particularly important and lasting. And I think what we really see is how the both artists with their own mediums are able to explore the sheer vitality of uh, one's physicality. Each work is really quite extraordinary, but we have a 62 portrait of Peter Lacy, it's the year Peter Lacy dies, and it's the first one in which 
they can also portray uh, the internal organs that are very much bursting to the skin. So in a way, also looking at all these different layers of reproduction and photography, all the way to X-ray and lenses and so forth. You have this uh, great uh, study of a portrait of Lucien Freud, which actually initially painted as a triptych and then he divided into three worlds. And again, it's incredible how the paintwork on the face shows you can see this sort of series of teeth that are moving and this sense of contortion of the expression. And then these two great worlds which are both in different ways, the triptych and the one at the back. Um, very complex memorials of uh, uh, George Dyer, uh, died in 71, on, just before this great opening at, in Paris, the Grand Palais. And uh, they're very much memorials. We are, in a way, looking at the way inserts portraits within the paintings brought here and in the other picture there as this sort of static remnants of one's memory. But then it's completely reanimating the body of Dyer. And what Bacon is incredible at doing is combines different images so in a way it creates these impossible bodies that could not exist in real life, but in so doing, it very much is able to show the sheer vitality of how the body moves over time and space. So they are really incredible monument to him. And once again, we see the way he sort of thinks of zooming into details and uh, lenses, which again we see here, uh, and the way the circles sort of describes the figure. This room sort of introduces the idea that uh, of working from photographs rather than working from life, um, which is very influential to uh, and Michael Andrews and R.B. Katai, whose work is shown in the next room. And the, the work in that room sort of pairs these two artists who were very interested in Bacon's use of photography as source material. Um, and it looks at their sort of groupings of figures, almost like party scenes. So there's works like the Colony Room, but also um, looking at uh, sites in other sites in London, um, like Katai's Wedding, for example, but also the um, Cecil Court, uh, which is where a lot of Jewish refugee booksellers used to used to be. And then we go into the Paul Arrigo Room, which is a monographic room by the artist Paul Arrigo, um, who centers women's stories. And she also, so she extracts a quite interesting dialectic between um, the autobiography, but also fables and fiction. Then the last room uh, is the contemporary room, which we're calling so contemporary developments, uh, which combines uh, four female figurative painters: um, Jenny Saville, Cecily Brown, Celia Paul, and Lynette Yerambuaki, uh, who all look at the figure in, in very different ways, but um, whose work you can sort of see resonances of. of uh, artists throughout the 21st century uh, and there's some interest in that work. For example, it's quite interesting that Lynette cites Sika is an example and she's the last work that you see and Sika is the, one of the first that you see so it comes full circle. <laughs> mm.